position of Gnostics. Let's come back to Ephesians, the second chapter again. We spent some time there last study through in the love of God as the great motivation for his reaching out to save perishing mankind and giving the universal demonstration of our need for salvation is brought about. We did bring a point of my co a little further. We made the statement that first of all comes the love of God and then comes faith. This, this will be true because uh, your first contact with God is, is his love, his outreach by love to you. And as you see that outreach, as you perceive the message brought to you, and uh, have your first contact with the love of God, faith begins to spring up and continue in consequence of that. Now that faith brings a greater revelation of God's love, which in turn brings a greater faith. And so it goes on to become the completeness of faith and trust in God at the end of the journey. Now, in Ephesians, the second chapter, we find that um, <coughs> in verse 5 and 6, 6 in particular, no, verse 5, first of all. Even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Made us alive together with Christ. To what extent shall we understand the word together with Christ in this, uh, in this uh, or I should say, alive together with Christ? The same. The same what? Life as the same life as Christ. Very good. To become partakers of the divine nature. We have in ourselves the actual life of Jesus Christ himself and therefore we are of the same family and of the same inheritance as he. By grace you've been saved. Now, what is the full scope of this word grace? Well, first of all, the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit and secondly, of course, the love of God and the favour of God. And, and uh, being saved by grace, we would not be saved by our own machinations or devisings, we have depended upon the power of God to achieve that. Verse 6, I'm not to read it please. And he hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heaven's places in Jesus Christ. Right. Now, in what sense do we right now sit together in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus? We're sitting right here in this room, which is only light years away from the heavenly courts. So physically we're certainly not uh, up in heaven with Christ, are we? Are we there physically? We're there by faith. Right? <laughs> now, is, is there a difference between the two? I mean, let's look at the Moses on the mountain top again in the days of uh, the Exodus, where he personally and physically went up the mountain and physically we stood in God's presence for 40 days, plus 40 days altogether, 80 days. Was that something better than simply hearing God afar off on the, on the, on the plane below? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. And likewise today, if we could uh, actually literally stand in heaven together with Christ, it would be, it'd be a, a deep experience for us. But it's certainly going to be a painful one too, because we have to come back to sin, sin, curse, dark and earth thereafter, just to the self in vision, which was a very oppressive to her spirits. Now, back in 1844, the wise virgins of God's true people did enter into the most holy place. Let's first of all read uh, Revelation chapter 3 in this respect. Revelation 3. A message to the Philadelphian church. I believe. Yes, Philadelphia. Let's take verse 7 to 8, please. In Revelation 3. <coughs> That's right. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who is the key of David, who opens and no one shall shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your words, behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Thank you. And this open door is into, into where? The most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And fulfilled the promise made to the wise virgins back in Matthew chapter 25. Let's go back there a second, shall we? 25, 25 to Matthew. And this famous parable, which we looked at so often in the past, begins in verse 1 and goes on down to verse 13. And um, we find that um, we 
read verse 10 and 11. Read about the foolish virgins. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterwards, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Thank you. Now, we find the wise virgins entering in through the open door at this appropriate time, and the foolish, of course, being kept out. In the great controversy, we find that this is explained very, very clearly and plainly for us. In truth, we should need to understand very much at the present time, page 427 in the great controversy. Um, let's read the two paragraphs, the one we give the proclamation. Behold the bridegroom cometh and one following. Page 427. Someone go with me, please. The proclamation? Yeah. The proclamation, Behold the bridegroom cometh. In the summer of 1844, led thousands to expect the immediate advent of the Lord. At the appointed time, the bridegroom came, not to the earth as the people expected, but to the Ancient of Days in heaven the marriage, the reception of his kingdom. They that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. They were not to be present in person at the marriage, for it takes place in heaven while they are upon the earth. The followers of Christ are to wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, Luke 12, 36. But they are to understand his work and to follow him by faith as he goes in before God. It is in this sense that they are said to go into the marriage. Thank you, Your Honor, for that point. Now, we're told in plain terms in what sense they went into the open door to the marriage at that point of time. And of course, God's true favor remained there in the interval up until the present moment. Now, they are to understand his work. Recall that I think yesterday we, we read from the Great Controversy, page 490 and page 491. Uh, wait, no, I, anyway. Can we say twice that everyone must understand for themselves the position of their high priest at the present moment? Otherwise, it would be impossible for us to fill that position quickly and, and, and have the faith needed at this time. So, at this time, in the closing days of this world, it is essential that we understand the position and work of our great high priest. We can't enter into the sanctuary and we do that. And was to follow him by faith as he goes in before God. By so doing, they enter in through the open door into the marriage, right? Not physically, but spiritually. So right at this present moment, every true believer, provided they understand the sanctuary message, and believes in it, and follows the correct procedures, is where, spiritually speaking, in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, Following Christ by faith in ministry there, preparing and being prepared for the final judgment scene and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Come to Ephesians again now, shall we? So right now, we're sitting together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In Paul's day, where did they sit then? In the first or second apartment? In the first apartment, right? And then the transition has come to the second apartment. Now all this is done, as verse 7 and 8 point out, to achieve a certain definite purpose on God's part. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 7 to 10. I think we should read it out. So God, please. That in the ages to come, we might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kingdom, and work us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved to faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should want any man. Thank you very much. Now, this elevation of humanity at present, at the present time, to sit together in the heavenly place with Christ, in Christ, and certainly again during the eternity yet to come is that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now, before the plan of self, before sin entered this world, the revelation of God's character was given to the angels, to the unformed beings. They saw this in his handiwork, they saw this of course in his doing with them as well. 
But that revelation was limited. There was there was certain large aspects of God's love which were not shown at that time. For instance, God did not have the opportunity to demonstrate his love for his enemies, did he? Because there were no enemies to love back then. And God's self-sacrificing spirit could hardly be shown as full beauty and power because of no immense self-sacrifice to make, no costly self-sacrifice to make. But um, the entrance of sin called upon God to exercise qualities and power that previously had not been called to action and to show he could and did love his enemies and to show that he likewise had the power to say that no matter what the cost might be to himself. Now this has opened up opened up doors of exploration to God's character which eternity itself shall never exhaust. They seem uh, a profound fact to us. Let's go to Desire of Age at this point and uh, take the chapter entitled God with us, Emmanuel God with us. We've then had this first answer with a lesson book of the universe for eternity. The very first chapter and the very first page I think we need to look at. Page 19. Take the first uh, two paragraphs of page 19, please. Somebody. His name, his name shall be called Emmanuel, God with us. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God, the image of his greatness and majesty the outshine of his glory. It was to manifest this glory that he came to our world. To this sin-darkened earth he came to reveal the light of God's love, to be God with us. Therefore it was prophesied of him, his name shall be called Emmanuel. You want me to go to this second? Yes, please. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. He was the word of God, God's thoughts made audible. In his prayer for his disciples, he says, I have declared unto them thy name, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. But not alone for this earth-born children was this revelation given. Our little world is a lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is a theme into which angels desire to look, and it will be their study throughout endless ages. Both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. In the light from Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven that the love which seeketh not her own was its source in the heart of God, and that in the meek and lowly one is manifested the character of him who dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto. One amazing two paragraphs which is what to begin this wonderful book with, as you just read. Let's go back now and analyze something of what this actually says. Now, Jesus Christ in eternity was the full and complete expression of the character of God, right? eternity. It's never has been different. But there was much that was hidden of God in this whole uh, mystery because of the lack of opportunity to, to, to demonstrate some of these, of all these factors. Now, it says on the second paragraph, by coming to talk with us, Jesus was to reveal both reveal God both to men and to angels. Now, can you reveal the revealed? Or do you reveal to reveal? Yes. You know, really. It's once thing is once thing has been revealed, it's no longer it's been revealed, it's, it's now accomplished that, right? Now, so Jesus came to reveal that which previously had not yet been revealed in regards to God's character, along with that which already had been revealed as well. This is not hard to understand as far as man is concerned, because how much did man know of God's character in the beginning, especially after sin? Nothing. Nothing at all, but the angels have lived with God for, for how long? We don't know, do we? But it could have been for a thousand billion years, for we know. And during all that time, they've been continually learning about the character of God, the love of God, and the power of God, the beauty and perfection of God. So, but Jesus came to build them more than ever known before, 
reveal God both to men and to angels. Um, our, our, little, our little world is a lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful, those who grace the mystery of the universe, those who think he's able to look and to be their study to endless ages. So all eternity shall never exhaust the full scope of the character of God or the wonders of the plan of salvation. So if we think today we know it all, how much do we yet know? It's virtually nothing. Right? We know something that's virtually nothing. So it certainly appears to be nothing by comparison. But I like the thought that the angels and the unformed beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their soul. Their science and their soul. Let's uh, ask ourselves what this word science, what this word soul mean in this connection. What first of all is the science that they shall find so worthy of praise and, and joy? Science of salvation. Science of salvation, yes. And the divine order. God's way is the expression of God's character. Um, let's just look at the, look at the sentence again, we'll get the first part of the in mind. It says, uh, both redeemed and the unformed being of Christ in the cross, their science and their song. The word science here, I believe, means their way of living. Now, find in that cross the guideline as to how they have to live, right? Because science is operational. Science is a procedure uh, expressive of the knowledge which comes, which makes up that science. So the cross of Christ, which, of course, is the ultimate expression of self-sacrificing love, will be the divine guide to them as to how they shall live, how they shall operate, what they shall do, and it'll be their song. Now, at the present time, because of sin's grip on our minds, we sometimes feel that obeying God is going to be a, a sacrifice we don't like to make, and we'd rather have God do it some other way. Which, of course, of course, we pray, prayer is designed to change God and not man, don't we? And uh, you tend to follow God without being, without singing about it, without being too happy about it sometimes, in some, some corners or sectors of our experience. But when we come to understand the science of the cross and all its fullness and beauty and power, we shall rejoice and sing about it every day of our experience up there, and even down here as well, of course. So the cross of God becomes our science and our song to our eternity, and it'll be the, the source of praise and blessing to the angels as well as to mankind who've experienced it. Uh, as we refer, it'll be seen that the glory showing in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. And this glory, of course, is both character and our showing at this point. And it will be shown as self-sacrificing love, of course, is the sheer glory that shines in the face of Jesus Christ and makes him so totally attractive. Now, to the worldly person, does the thought of self-sacrificing love for someone you hate fill them with song and joy? No. it with more hate. <laughs> <laughs> and to the um, legalistic church person, how does, he, how does he respond to this kind of proposition? Breaks his teeth and gets down to it. <laughs> That's right. But hates every bit of it. Hates every bit of it, but not so with the redeemed. In the light from Calvary, it will be seen the law of self nature known as the law of life for earth and heaven. So the law of life, the law which produces life, or I shouldn't I should say produces, but sustains life, because the law never produces life, does it? God produces life, but the law sustains life, so it's the life preserver. Remember the question I used to ask in that respect? Mm -hmm. I'll just repeat them by way of review. If the broken law of God is a life uh, taker, which it is, then the unbroken law is a life preserver. Preserver, you've learned your lesson well. <laughs> Don't get caught again, right? <laughs> God love is a life giver, the law is a life preserver, and the broken law is a life taker. So we've seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life or life preservation and life development, life strengthening for that for earth and heaven. So up in heaven we find the same principles and procedures will govern the life of the angel as they do down here. <laughs> and that the love which seeks to learn has its source in the heart of God, and that the meek and lowly one is manifested to the character of him who dwells in life which no man can approach unto. So where is the source or fountain of this lovely six dollars in? In the heart of God, right? And that the 
meek and lowly one is manifested, and who is the meek and lowly one? Christ. Jesus Christ. He has manifested the character of him who dwells the most in Hegel Christ. Under who, who is that? God the Father, right? And the fact that, that Sister White chose to present Christ as the meek and lowly one is proof that God himself is the meekest and lowliest of all. Yeah. Sister White could have said in the powerful and just one or the righteous one or the omnipotent one that she said the meek and lowly one is a manifestation of God's character of love. And just come back to the previous page a moment. Sister White quotes the script here in John 9, verse 7, 14, 15 chapter where um, Jesus said that the love where if you love me may be in them and I in them. Right? So Christ's great desire and prayer was that the love wherewith God had loved him should be in the disciples as well as he being in them as well. And what a prayer Christ prayed on occasion and certainly was answered the Pentecost when God's love was manifest in and through them on that wonderful love of the endowment of power. So when we read in Ephesians, the first or the second chapter, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness for us in Christ Jesus, this is a reference to the fact that in all eternity there will be an ongoing study of the character of God, the grace of God, the love of God, the power of God, and it will never come to its end. Now, think about that. Just think about it. We've lived in this world, some of us, I suppose, up to the sixth decade of our lives. Maybe I'm going to have done that so far. We all lived uh, a little while, and in that time we have learned much about the character, we think as much about the character of God and the grace of God and so forth. Now imagine yourself there with 20 times the intellectual power you personally have, which you, which you have up there, 20 times your personal mental power and spiritual perception, spending, shall we say, 100 years learning God's character, and not exhausting it. Thousand years, ten thousand, ten million, ten million, ten trillion, and still, after all that time, not exhausting the, the so the character of God, what a feel for study that must be. Think about it. Wait, it's going to be fantastic, isn't it? And the angels, of course, will be with us in our study, and we will share with them the. The thing we have learned down here upon this earth. I like that type of education at this point in regard to uh, witness and redeemed um, to the angels and the important beings in the heavenly course. The thing is, this of course, that we human beings will have experienced, as the rest will not have experienced, the actual salvation of God. Thank you very much. Um, take the last paragraph to in the actual course. Uh, education. So to ask the question, for what reason did the plan of salvation put an operation? Right, page 3 I to page 3 and I. Does anybody else have the book, Education? I do, but I don't know how long it will take me to find it. Uh-huh. Okay, what page was it? The last page of the book. Mm-hmm. Page 308. There are heights and depths that eternity itself can never exhaust, marvels into which the angels desire to look. The redeemed only of all created beings have in their own experience known the actual conflict with sin. They have wrought with Christ, and as even the (coughs) angels could not do, have entered into the fellowship of his sufferings. Will they have no testimony as to the science of redemption, nothing that will be of worth to unfallen beings? What's the obvious answer? We will have a tremendous contribution to make. But let's skip two paragraphs now. That always starts in our life here. 
in our life here, earthly, sin-restricted though it is, the greatest joy and the highest education are in service. And in the future state, untrammeled by the limitations of sinful humanity, it is in service that our greatest joy and our highest education will be found. Witnessing and ever as we witness, learning anew the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27. Thank you. There'll be three kinds of people in the eternity to come. First of all, there'll be the mere onlookers of the great struggle, which are the dwellers upon distant planets and distant worlds throughout the universe. Secondly, the angels who have been assistants with us in the battle against sin. And thirdly, of course, the team who have been actually participants in the struggle against iniquity. They're the ones who've been in the pit of sin and saved from it. Now, obviously, of course, uh, the ones who have been best acquainted with the power and love of God will be the redeemed, will they not? They, they've experienced for themselves what sin is, its power, and so forth, and they've known what it means to be drawn out of that pit into salvation's ways. Now, all three of these uh, categories will, will jointly study the plan of salvation, deliverance from sin, and eternity eternity when it comes. Now, I'd like to understand a little bit better myself, so I'll put some points for you to consider. We are asking ourselves how a subject can be so profound, a subject we already know to a certain extent, as to provide the internal investigation of its beauty and power. So that, that's, that's, that's some depth, that's, that's some, some breadth and some height and so on. Think, for instance, of what you experienced yourself. And suppose you required or, or given the opportunity now to stand up and and, and give a, a complete witness, as best you know it, of what has been done for you by the gospel, how long would it take you? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> All right, ten minutes, one person said. Anyone who wants to add to that? Well, you're dying with your lifetime, of course. Should it be the faith? I mean, uh, demonstration of that self-sacrifice and love in death, like Christ did for us, is infinite, and yet it didn't take a long span to come. Quite right, sure. But actually, it's the experience of your entire life. Yeah, yeah. which is a ritual period compared to eternity, right? So, um, it would seem that when we get there, we shall see things about us that we don't see at the present time. We shall see the power of sin, and uh, the mechanism, mechanism of sin, the nature of sin, the character of it, it's, it's uh, way it works and so forth. And as we look at the plan of salvation, we we'll basically realize that we have been delivered from much we didn't even know about. And eternity will still be needed to investigate to its fullness the plan of God for us personally as well as for everyone else as well. So that uh, we shall find ourselves in studying that plan and our own relationship to it and witnessing to it as long as eternity shall last, which will be, of course, eternal. So when Paul talks then about God showing, um, where is it again? <coughs> the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus, he's referring then to the revelations that were given to the unfallen beings, to the angels and the man during the eternity, which is not too far away now. What a, what a joy it's going to be. We enjoy studying the plan of salvation now, but how much more when we come to that time of deeper understanding. Now, verse 8, Ephesians, the second chapter. For by the reading, please. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Now, let's go to Romans 6.23, keep in place to be with the right back in just a second there. And, um, this verse is reached for the wages of sin is that of the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This for an Adventist is, is hard to grasp. And I recall that uh, before I even grasped that truth, there came to me the message of Wagon and Jonah to a fourth angel of message first, then I grasped it. It happened as follows. I was giving a Bible study to a young man in a tenement building in Palmerston, North New Zealand. Just a, a very small single man's room, and uh, we sat on the bed studying together. And I read that verse, and suddenly I saw the tremendous impact of the gift of God. The gift of God is eternal life. 
right? The gift of God. It comes to us as a gift. We read in our last study period from Acts the Apostle, page 551, about the best gift that God can serve, which is the love of God, which of course in turn is the life of God too. You know, deeply embedded in the human organism is the, is the subconscious residue of the long standing belief that we have to work to save ourselves. Now, when I first came to California back about 1965 or 6, I uh, emphasized from steps to Christ the point that we can't make ourselves as good before we come to God. We must come to Christ just how as we are. With our sin, our iniquity and everything, just come just like we are. And one man had been having this all his life, came up and said after me, he was over, what he said, that's the first time I realized this. I've always felt and believed I had to make myself good first. So God would so Christ would accept it, then come to him and be accepted by him. But obviously, of course, if you wait for that, you wait forever. Salvation is the gift of God. It comes without money, without price. Although, of course, we have to pay a pretty heavy price in sacrifice this world to make room for the gift of God in our hearts our experience. Now Paul stresses this point in the next few verses as well. We'll come to this shortly, but he makes it quite plain here. Uh, you've been saved through faith and not on yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now perhaps we should just um, remind ourselves of what we have to do to obtain that gift. If you think a gift is just the power to hand receive it, but there's more than more to that of course. <coughs> First thing is this, that the gift of God is an all-filling quality. It does not occupy a corner of the whole person. So therefore, if, if there existed if there exists a previous occupant, what must happen to the previous occupant? It must be expelled. Right? It must be expelled or eradicated or removed. <coughs> so bear in mind then the important point that the gift of God is an all-pervading, all-filling element which, which occupies the entire human nature and will not share that human nature with somebody else. Especially when somebody else, of course, the child of Satan. Two so they can't draw together. And therefore they must first of all be the eradication of one and the installation of the other. Now does the Bible purposely and adequately illustrate this principle of eradication and replacement? So they don't. Born wish, for instance, experienced back in Egypt, the man possessed of evil spirits, the person stricken with disease, and what else can we mention? Marriage symbol in Romans. No, the marriage symbol in Romans. Over and over again, the Bible emphasizes and repeatedly emphasizes the point there must be an eradication of the old occupant before the new occupant. The new occupant can take the place of the old. It's made very clear in the word of God. We, we can't miss it. What amazes me, of course, is, 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 is that this is missed by many people. I'll never, never forget being out in Tennessee, in Wichita, Tennessee, quite a few years ago, back in 65, 66. And uh, a farmer in the Brinsmead camp out there stood in the field and, and, and had his feet with a thorn bush about a quarter from each side, just, just beginning to grow. And he said uh, to me, he said, well, he said, this illustrates my Christian experience. He said, I put my foot in that thorn bush like this and crushed it to the ground. And all day long I hold my foot down the thorn bush can't tear or scratch them. I got a bit of nightmares in this form which brings up again like I take it off to sleep. The next morning I put it back on again. He said, and every day I repeat this performance of crushing the thorn bush, but it's growing bigger and bigger. And eventually it'll be too big to push down with his boot. Now I marvel that then because when he went out to farm his land, would he treat the thorn bush that way? Is it tear it out by its roots and replace with a new a new tree altogether or a new flag altogether? Now, I just stand in marvel at the way we spoke or reject that simple principle of rooting out the thorn bush and replacing the new tree altogether, which is the only way that you can find yourself possessed of the tree in your garden. So, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, His Son. Now, it's not a work that any man should boast. We've we had the word works brought to our attention during this week by the little bit. Now, is there work involved in our salvation? Yes. yes. Who does that work? God does. It's His gift, so He does the work. He provided the gift in the first place and transmits the gift in the second place, and therefore it's His work. So when it says not of works, does it mean any works at all? No, it means our works, right? It means our effort to 
save ourselves. And when you find a church organisation which does not believe in the eradication of placement, they believe then in the subjugation and control of the old man, don't they? Modification and improvement of the old. Right, modification and improvement of the old. And do they achieve an improvement of the old? Yes. They certainly do. Very commendable improvement to you sometimes. Well, yes, also the ambition and desire. They want to go to heaven and escape from all this terrible trouble down here, so fear is involved and also desire as well in both cases. <coughs> so let me pick the point that, that the modified improvement is sometimes a very, a very excellent result, a very commendable result, so at least with but. No matter how much you may embellish or improve this old human nature, it is doomed to destruction. Nothing can save it. And therefore it must be replaced with something which takes its position instead. So that um, let's, let's avoid then going to work to, to improve our courtesy, our kindness, our love, our humility and so forth. It doesn't pay in the end because it must all go anyhow and be replaced by the new life instead. Now, if we were saved by our own works, then what would, what, what would we do? We'd boast. Okay? Now, I'd like to go to Galatians 3, 221, 321 now. Let's back one book, of course. Uh, I, I'll read these two verses because the only way which a man can improve himself is by the application of law. Is that right? The only way which a man can improve himself is by the application of law. God's not given law, it's the only way. That's a works program. Right, let's, let's read Galatians 2.21, shall we, first of all? Do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. Now I love that verse for all my heart, so let's read 3.21 at the same time. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. If there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. Okay. Now, Paul plainly says in this verse, Galatians 2.21, that if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And in uh, 3.21, if there had been a law given which could have given, given life, truly righteousness would have been by the law. And Paul says, if such a law had been given or such a principle was, was operational, but it isn't, there's no such law made through which life can be produced. This is why man today always efforts to produce life will never succeed because he only has a law to work with, doesn't he? Nothing more than that. And by the law you can't produce life. Absolutely impossible. You might say, well, what about the birth of a baby? But that is simply the continuation of existing life. The multiplication of existing life, not the introduction of new life in its place. For instance, if when a species dies out, such as whooping cranes or rhinoceros or whatever, or whales, when these species die out, how much does man or the whale have to, to start, start the race again? No one to it. It's gone, lost completely. No. So we need to understand that the other issue is that righteousness is not by the law. The law preserves, but does not give to us to give the righteousness of life. If it did, then we should boast, and we would find ourselves uh, on the wrong side of the left for sure. Now, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God declared before that we should walk in them. Now this word workmanship uh, points to what capacity on God's part. How, how does God accomplish his workmanship? So the Spirit of God, right? No one more than that. Well, that's right, by creation. God is a creator. God is a creator. And in as much as the new life replaces the old, and as much as the new life is the life of God Himself, then it's not a work of the law or a lot of what is proven is actual creation. Second Corinthians 5 verse 10 makes the point quite very clear too. So we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, we have today in the world Protestant churches and Catholic, Catholic churches as well. And they all declare you cannot obey the law of God, it can't be done. Is that sentiment expressed? You can't keep the law of God. 
Because they claim to be saved from sin. Now think about that. If you're saved from sin, you're saved into righteousness. Okay, that's one or the other. You can't be saved from sin, still be in sin. Now, if you're saved from sin, you're saved from law breaking, which is what sin is. Then you're saved from law breaking, you can't be still in law breaking and be out of it. So you're saved from law keeping. Right? Which means you're saved from unrighteousness into righteousness. So it's impossible for a person to say, I'm saved from sin and yet still be in sin. Impossible to say, I'm saved from sin and at the same time say, you can't stop sinning. It's just, it's just a contradiction. Entirely so. In God's truth, of course, the, the uh, principle is this, that He has the power to save us from sin. And over and over throughout the Word of God, God has declared that we can live righteously. What Satan declares, of course, this can't be done. We believe God rejects Satan's lies because of what they are. Mm -hmm. Right, well, Tom has gone again, surprisingly enough, so I just thought this point in a few seconds left. Any questions you'd like to ask or less what to make? Yes, Mark, Mary. Mm -hmm. Versus this man who thought he just had to put his foot on the thorn bush and keep it down. Okay, I found this statement in volume five of the testimony report, page 474. Can hear me over the ring, huh? <laughs> okay, in volume five of the testimonies, page 474, I found their earthliness must be removed to be eradication. Okay. that the image of Christ may be perfectly reflected. Unbelief must be overcome, which I see kind of like putting their foot on the thorn bush. Okay. Faith, hope, and patience are to be developed, kind of like re-education. And I got to thinking that what we have is our whole Christian experience involves all three of those steps, eradication, subduing, and re-educating. And what we need to do is learn how to, what areas of our life need those particular things. And if we reapply, make wrong applications in any one area, then we've got a wrong concept. When we don't get the salvation. So we just need to learn to draw those distinctions and know where they are. Yeah, I just, I, yeah. Yes. Just, just another observation for whatever, uh, just something that came across. When you talked about the parable of the ten virgins, it, it was interesting. You know, she, the first words of the, of the parable says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened unto ten virgins. And in the great controversy 347, she says, In many of his parables, Christ, uh, Christ uses the expression, The kingdom of heaven, to designate the work of divine grace upon the hearts of men. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. We tend to think of heaven as being a material place with golden streets and bloody gates and mansions and lovely trees of light, rivers of light and so on, but more importantly it's the word of grace for man's heart. It, 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 it opened up uh, my mind to reevaluate the, uh, the whole parable in light of God's divine grace working upon the hearts of men in the parable. That's what Jesus said to Nicodemus, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom. You weren't referring to a church organization or a heavenly paradise, but to the working of God's grace in the heart. And the Nicodemus could see that. Yes, Very true. The kingdom isn't just a separate place because uh, Christ also said the kingdom of behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Right. Yes, you know. Two points. I can see that the self-sacrificing law was, ne was, was not understood. It wasn't revealed until sin came in. Not fully. Not fully. It was there, but never really. Right. It was operational. Yeah. So they kept it that we must uh, keep it. Right. Now, that as a principle is reinstated in the Christian. And so I could see it that when Israel had sinned, Moses asked that he would rather be blotted out. Then, uh, then Israel, mm -hmm. then starting you, and same with Paul, he was ready to give his life up that his brethren could see. Spontaneously. Yeah. Now I was wondering. Now Satan came to Paul and used that principle, which was good, and caused his early demise, let's say. Right. Well, Satan came to Paul, and because Paul had that that principle so strongly in him. 
he went to Jerusalem when he should never have gone. In other words, his ministry wasn't ready to go yet. Understanding equals wisdom. That's how I gathered it. And without knowledge and understanding, how can you know God's character? And then how can you pull, let go of that love unless, you know, it's a false love? This it's possible. It's possible to have a, a powerful love for God and for your fellow men. And be and be unwise and just yeah, that's okay. possible. Thanks for telling me that. Okay. Um, the answer, if I had tried to answer your question for you, um, what I've come to understand is you can have that self-sacrificing love is a principle within you but part of that is self-sacrifice is total submission and self is ever striving to take control again so what we have to do is continually stay submitted into God's hands and let him be that wisdom and what I see in Paul he wanted so much to become one with his brethren and break down that barrier that self took control and self said it was wise for him to go even if it meant his death that was self-sacrifice enough, but it was his decision to go. He didn't trust and let the Lord make that decision for him. But he still had God's wisdom there, to a certain point. Well, I'm not, not that he didn't have God's wisdom. He did not submit to let God make the choice. But he Sol chose Solomon to go did, to Jerusalem. Solomon did the same thing. He, back, he fell back for 40 years. He was full of God's wisdom. Okay, well, I'm we have to have a distinction between God's wisdom yep. and his... His, his mercy and that he lets you make your own choice all along the way. Even if you have his wisdom, even if you have his love, you still have to choose. That's the point. You still have to choose. Mm -hmm. See, That's Fred, the, the reason why I brought it up, the reason why I interrupted, okay, is because I deeply believe that if I don't know God's nature, okay, and his ways, I truly can't love him. I can't fool myself. I can't go by what you taught me to love God or what 
Mary me Tommy or, or what John Paul or Harry made, I have to go by God's nature and if I don't know God like if I wouldn't know my own father how could I love him once I know my own father I, I have the wisdom and the understanding to perceive love from him and to nurture it from there, yeah. there on that's why I asked Mary is quite right in every sense you must choose to let God be a God plan maker that's, 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 that's been the great mistake over the right there through history. Again and again, men who love God very deeply have been their own plan makers instead of letting God be the plan maker. But is that fair? Yeah. No. That? Why should I be my own plan maker? How can I plan for you divine should, salvation if I am carnal? You should, you should read uh, the book entitled Edging into God's Sabbath Rest. I did. You did? <laughs> and you have the answers. No, no, the, the, what I want to get clarified is what you just said now about wisdom. Okay. There's many degrees of wisdom. I think everybody, every, every true Christian of God has wisdom to a certain degree. We're not completely empty minded. That's true. But let's, let's look still at remain, Paul still remains that when a crisis comes requiring you to, do, do, to follow a certain course of action, we don't always have the wisdom or ex exercise the wisdom, I should better put it to let God be the plan maker in that situation. We may not execute it, but we do have it then. What's that? We may not execute wisdom, but we do have it. Yeah, that's If right. you're, I mean, a true Christian of God, of God would have it, compared to an atheist or heathen that does not understand God. Yeah, but that wisdom comes through education. And as, as we study God's ways... God's nature, yes. Okay. And His ways sure. as well. The science of, the science of obedience then we come to learn what we should do in a given situation. And wouldn't that love grow also at the same time in different proportion? Yeah, the, love, the love and the wisdom both grow continually if, well, we, if, well, we, if, we, if we do the right thing. Well, you've answered my question. Thanks, Fred. Good. Margaret? I was just going to say an example would be Lazarus when Christ's love wanted to go to him and save him from dying, but God plans had a higher